Um, okay, let's start. <laughs> Let me just put my screen like this first. Um, and welcome to, good morning and welcome to the academic stage. This morning we have a great lineup of presentations for you that talk mm -hmm. on cropland changes, for example, um, that are related to violent conflict, to landslide monitoring in Vietnam using Sentinel-1 imagery. My name is Carol and I will be the session leader for the academic, uh, this academic session. <clears throat> and before I introduce our first speakers, please note that five minutes at the end of the talk is allocated for a question and answer session. Mm -hmm. So please feel free to put in your questions in the Q&A chat and I will be monitoring these as the talks progress. The first talk today is, um, the first talk today is titled Assessing Cropland Changes from Violent Conflict in Central Mali with Sentinel-2 and Google Earth Engine by Alex and Law. Alex is a cow mapper and drought specialist based in Senegal, or up until recently was based in Senegal. Um, for the most part of the decade, he has dedicated or utilized FOSS to encourage open data solutions to understand food security insecurity in West Africa with a focus on the needs of livestock herding communities. Most of his work has been on developing tools and methods to track the changing movements of livestock herds as they respond to climate change. The second speaker, Law, discovered Earth observation when she joined the European Space Agency in Rome at the time when the fleets of Sentinel were launched. She later then joined the World Food Program headquarters to apply remote sensing to the humanitarian sector, and since 2019 has been based in West Africa to explore further linkages between conflict and land cover changes. So without further ado, um, I will add the speakers for our session, Alex and Law, to take us through their first talk. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll start, I'll share our screen here. Uh -huh. Now, I think everybody can uh, can see this. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, just to be clear, uh, Laure, uh, or Carol, is this visible? Yes. Excellent. So, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, so, as Carol mentioned, my name is Alex, and I'm presenting uh, with uh, Laure. Uh, and we're talking about how to use uh, Sentinel-2 to show uh, cropland abandonment from violent conflict in central Mali. Uh, we'll be going through a little bit about uh, the background behind the analysis, why we did it, to uh, what the actual method included, and a little bit of information on uh, you know, how this is reproducible, maybe how you could do this, and where we're going next. So to give you a little bit of background and context, uh, we're talking about uh, a study area of Mali, uh, specifically central Mali, uh, the region of Mopti. So uh, Mali, uh, one thing that's important to know is uh, gets a single rainy season um, and it has a harvest in September or October. And this is important to know because this means that every year uh, the food security analyses are performed in September and October with the harvest. Um, this is usually done by looking at uh, agricultural production data and, you know, basically assuming, okay, has enough food been produced uh, to meet the population's basic needs? Um, unfortunately, since 2011, there's been an ongoing conflict and humanitarian emergency. Um, a lot of armed conflict has been happening and now about in 2020, about 760,000 people were food insecure. Um, so there's this ongoing conflict, um, which is creating a lot of food insecurity. And uh, one thing to note is that the vast majority of the population depends on either subsistence agriculture or livestock herding. So basically what that means is this harvest period determines a lot. Um, and in order to figure out what the food security situation is and whether or not uh, uh, and to, to determine whether or not there's going to be food assistance and how it's going to be distributed, be distributed, excuse me, that typically depends on agricultural surveys. But if you have a situation where you have uh, ongoing armed conflict, that makes in-person surveys almost impossible to do. 
So long story short, there is a huge data gap in understanding food insecurity in Mali. Uh, oftentimes at the time of the harvest, we simply don't know what the situation is. Now, what this means is that there's a lot of cropland abandonment. Basically, during armed conflict, uh, you know, you will have villages that where people might be fleeing or where uh, fields cannot be accessed because it's just too unsafe. So this is something that can actually be seen from space. Uh, we have an example here of Sentinel-2 imagery. On the left, you have an image from August 2017, which is a pretty regular year for cropland. And on the right, you have the exact same area, but in 2019, two, uh, two years into an ongoing conflict in the area. So you can see August, this is a you know, sort of prime growing period for crops. You can see a huge gap between natural vegetation and the area that should be being cropped. It's bare soil. Um, this is pretty strong indication of cropland abandonment. This shows you, especially on the lower left part of the screen, um, you can see basically where these fields aren't being tilled. Uh, and this is important to note for a couple of reasons. One is the obvious food security implication of it, right? Um, if the vast majority of your population depends on subsistence agriculture and you are not growing uh, and, you know, uh, hundreds of villages just simply aren't growing food right now, that has huge implications for hunger. But also it's important to note that it has uh, pretty strong implications for where the conflict is happening. If you don't have a lot of ground data on conflict, but uh, you can see where cropland is being abandoned, where fields are being abandoned, that shows you a pretty good, uh, pretty good data set of actually where the conflict is happening. And in the absence of ground data, this can be important. So what did we do? We developed an analysis of interannual cropland change and cropland abandonment. Um, well, Laure really did most of the work. Laure developed it, really. This is uh, um, basically Laure's method uh, is uh, a toolkit that identified 493 villages with significant cropland losses just for this one analysis, but it's been spread to a lot of other areas of the Sahel. Um, and what's really unique about this is it shows you very, it can create a data visualization very easily, which we're going to show on which areas have been abandoned um, and which are still having ongoing cropping. Uh, the target audience are humanitarian actors, uh, which means that it's a toolkit that needs a quick turnaround, right? It's being done and implemented in an emergency setting. And it's the method is uh, the three period time scan. And the bulk of it is that it creates a time series composite of, NDVI, of, a, of an NDVI image stack. So it m creates multiple NDVI images from throughout the growing season, and it puts them in a single image stack that allows for really easy visual interpretation. And so I'm going to hand it over to Laure, who's gonna talk a little bit about the methodology now, um, and she will go into greater detail. So uh, Laure, if you wanna take it away. Okay, cool, thanks Alex, and um, hi everyone. So I'm gonna go a bit more in detail in the methodology um, and to start with uh, the data and the tools that were used. So the analysis, is based um, on Sentinel-2 imagery uh, because it combines the best characteristics to really depict uh, agriculture in Mali and ag actually in the Sahel, more generally speaking. But um, for this study, we've been focusing on Mali. And so, yeah, basically the fact that um, it has a spatial resolution of 10 meters, it really um, is vital because in those areas, especially rural areas where they most of the um, agricultural fields are not um, mechanized, uh, it means they are really small. And so, even looking at with Landsat imagery or some other um, lower resolution would not um, help. So it was really uh, essential to use Sentinel two, and because. There is um, archive imagery available since 2016, means that we could actually go back in time um, before the start of the security crisis, uh, which in this area was mostly like 2018, 2019, um, depending on the area. Uh, so Sentinel-2, and uh, this is for the data. And uh, regarding the 
processing environments. Uh, we've used Google Earth Engine, which I don't think I need, I probably don't need to go too much in detail. It's now a very uh, commonly used and well-known uh, tool. Um, but yeah, it's it, it, it was, it, you can see a, um, a screenshot of this uh, script that is at the end of the day, very, very simple, very short. And um, yeah, we, we can um, share it as a link that probably um, we will, we can send um, to whoever is interested. And I'm going to explain a bit more what it does, but just want to focus on the fact that those tools um, it's very important to, for us to use uh, and have developed this methodology around uh, freely accessible tools uh, because we work with local partners uh, and in uh, in country uh, governments and it's very important that like, we can't really pro uh, propose a um, methodology that's based on expensive tools and everything. So if we want it to be used and yeah, so that was um, what I wanted to focus on. Now we can look at what the actual um, script so the, the what the script does what it looks like with the three period time scan so alex maybe you can go to the next slide yes thanks um alex mentioned the three period time scan so what is it um so this is this uh, image in the middle and the very colorful image is the three period time scan um it's derived from um uh, let's say approximately 20 images from uh, sentinel 2 images that are available between uh, 15th of June, which is the beginning, let's say, yeah, theoretically the beginning of the growing season in the area and uh, 15th of October, which is more or less the end. Um, why is it good? Like, why is it useful? Just when we compare it to a single dead image, which we have an example on the left, uh, it's just an image taken from Google Earth where we can guess, but not so, not so easily um, that there are two, uh, two villages Oops. two villages and some agricultural fields, but it's quite hard to say whether it's actually cultivated or not. And in any case, it's an image from dated from April 2018, right? So now like we want to compare actually between years. And so the, the time scan, the three period time scan, the colorful image is, uh, is this composite image that actually really um, that singles out uh, cropland. So you can see in, in uh, darker colors, um, the cropland compared to natural vegetation, which is much lighter like cyan and the village, um, the villages built up areas in black. And you can actually even see um, an image that was taken from the ground that we got to go at the end of uh, the growing season 2019 in one of those village um in one of those villages and you can really see very clearly the the delineation between agricultural fields on the left and the natural vegetation that has grown over uh what used to be uh cultivated fields before right so yeah so this is what it is this is what it looks like now uh how what what's behind it what what it actually is um in the next slide we try to put together a graph that uh, explains uh, that the three period time scan, time scan is basically a red, green, blue composite of NDVI values along the agricultural season. So it really shows the evolution in time of vegetation. Um, and that's why it's useful because we're trying to look at um, agricultural uh, fields and they have a different uh, vegetation evolution in time uh, compared to natural vegetation, right? So the, so the red band corresponds to the maximum value of NDVI um, in the beginning in the at the beginning of the agricultural season. So let's say like you can see approximately I've shown um, the, the the graph is showing the um, the rainfall and the NDVI over that area of interest. Uh, the NDVI, generally speaking, um, for the whole area. Um, now, green is for the middle um, period and um, blue is for the end, the, the end of the period. So it's usually when the peak of vegetation is reached, right? So now to the next slide where you can see um, why it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very basic idea. It's very simple actually, but it just really is useful and, and um, it reveals the patterns um, that are quite easy to interpret and the different land cover types are just, um, yeah, associated with different, with 
specific colors, right? So agriculture will have um, the land is being prepared at the beginning of the season, so it's it's almost barren land, and then it grows, um, reaching a peak, and then it's going to be harvested. The forest is always going to have a very high uh, vegetation index, and natural vegetation is it really depends, and um, especially in those areas uh, where uh, the Sahelian band is is quite specific. So it's quite hard to there's not one natural vegetation, uh, but we just put this to to give an idea. Uh, so yeah. So I hope that gives a, a, a good idea of how this uh, three-period uh, time scan is, uh, is obtained. Now we can look at um, an example, because what we want to find is the, the changes, right? So if we go to the next slide, then we see in Google Earth Engine directly uh, how it looks like. So this is 2016, where you see very clearly all the, the croplands and the difference when um, you go and see the, the three period time scan for 2019. So this is this is it. Now it's uh it's quite clear. So <clears throat> this uh this is what um yeah what it reveals that basically in 2019 people stopped cultivating far from the villages because it got too risky. Um and so yeah we can we can clearly see the, the massive um abandonment inland. And why is it um how was it used? So like this, this is the products, right? So we understand them, and but working in West Africa with the humanitarian and uh, actors, we need to translate this into a product that's going to be useful and that's going to arrive on decision makers' desks. And so if you go to the next slide, Alex, you can see how this was translated into one um, clear product that gives an overview um of the cropland change uh in the multi region so this is in 2019 but we also did it for the following years uh compared to pre-conflict years and so in red you have the severe decrease which is more than half uh of the agricultural uh, uh surface areas for each locality uh, that um were abandoned in orange you have the medium decrease and and yellow for the slides and um, yeah so it really reveals areas of uh, high vulnerability, villages that um, where something happened clearly. And so we try to understand why, and, and we overlapped also with the ACLED data, which you can see is, as the brown circles. Uh, and so it clearly shows that there is a link uh, where you have violent events doesn't mean you have cropland abandonment, where, where you have cropland abandonment, CV decrease, in agricultural lands, then you have uh, violence ongoing in the area um, in that year. Um, so yeah, um, this is this has been useful um, because there's a lack of understanding in what's going on in this area, right? And it's always quite it it makes it hard for um, okay local. Um, institutions, but also like humanitarian uh, organizations to make decisions. So on the next slides, I've tried to put together the type of the two main operational uses that are done with um, this product. Uh, the first one is the, that it, it's used, it's, it, it's integrated into national food security analysis, uh, which occur um, twice a year. And, and are essential to yeah for for the organizations in country. Uh, so it's it's this info this uh, sorry analysis is used to inform the, especially in hard to reach areas where there's no field data, no field survey that could be conducted. And it's also used um, by the humanitarian actors themselves to um, better target the assistance um, when when uh, organizing and planning their earlier response. Right, so this is a very quick overview. I think um, that's it for me, and I'm um, leaving Alex to conclude on that. Thanks. Thanks, Ro. So um, basically, yeah, to end it, I guess where we're going next. Uh, the first is, you know, scaling up. Uh, this is a method that, you know, is not just limited to uh, central Mali. So right now, uh, you know, this method is being tried for other contexts and other situations across West Africa. But perhaps most interesting to you, 
uh, the audience is uh, the fact that you know you can access this. So the Google Earth Engine uh, code uh, is on a GitHub. We just got to clean that up a little bit uh, before we publish it. But uh, you can contact either Laure or myself, um, and we can you know share it with you. And we've also developed, uh, we've translated it uh, for PyQGIS. So you can actually run the analysis directly from QGIS without having to go into Google Earth Engine. Um, we have experimented with machine learning. I mean, we were, you know, typically whenever we present this, um, we talk about the fact that we use visual interpretation. And the common question is always, well, why don't you automate it? Um, and so we are experimenting with it. But right now, machine learning um, is not appropriate for operational use. Uh, you have so much heterogeneity in the Sahel of different spectral signatures for cropland that it requires a lot of cleaning and you simply cannot use the same algorithm year in, year out. Um, you would have to do a lot of tweaking and that's just simply, we don't have the time for that. You know, we're looking at a turnaround time of, you know, a couple of weeks, oftentimes less that humanitarian actors need immediately after the harvest. Um, we're also, you know, working on, you know, trying to develop synergy with regional initiatives and early warning systems uh, to try and, you know, make this method more accessible, more usable, and more in sync with, um, you know, what's being done in West Africa right now on early detection of, uh, of food crises. And the last is, you know, capacity building. Uh, in addition to, you know, it's not just enough to make this toolkit open source, but really to try and do you know, trainings and try and get people to use it um, and try to make it as, you know, um, easy as possible of a transition for people to use it. And really bridging the gap between the humanitarian um, and or the operational and the technical communities. So you know, thank you very much. Uh, you can contact either of us uh, by email or Twitter. Uh, we have uh, our emails here. And at the bottom, there's a citation um, for the paper. Um, if you want to use it and check out the data, please don't hesitate to contact either of us uh, for code or with you know, further clarifications. Or if you just want to talk you know, um, about this, we're more than happy uh, to stay in touch. So thank you. And I guess uh, we can open it up to questions if there are any. Thanks. Thank you, Alex and Law. That was a very interesting presentation. It's different when you read like the abstract and you see the full blown <laughs> work. It actually like boggles my mind. Um, so our stream is a little bit delayed, but they you do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is: Are you also thinking of making an Earth Engine app to share results with non-experts? Yeah. Uh, do you wanna? Yeah. So, I think yeah, there was a, the, the, that's a good question. We also yeah thought, and I think we we made um, an app, but it was mostly like to show the different type scan uh, in the different trainings that we conduct. It's always super interesting because then you look at the different years and the time scan and but then to actually conduct the analysis it's uh actually good to have access to the processing environment and create so from this you can actually create the the shape files directly of like localities that are affected so yeah it's uh, it's actually um uh something that can be done um pretty easily i don't know if alex you want to add anything um no uh i mean yeah you know an app probably would be a good idea but also, I mean, the, the Google Earth engine code, it's, you know, it's already uh, pre-chewed. So you basically just, all you have to do is press run. Uh, you know, you put in your point um, at the top line and you just press the run and it, it generates it pretty quickly. So um, you don't even actually need to write any code uh, to use it. Um, I see a next question on how can I get a geo tiff of the derived products? Um, I mean, you can download it from Google Earth Engine. Um, there is an export option, um, yeah. and I think I think Laura, in the last version of the code, we have we have a, we have an export commented out. Uh, I think for I think so. Yeah, yeah, it's something. It's uh, it's very easy to add. 
Uh, and we've tried this also because then uh, it was interesting to to further explore the three time period time scan in QGIS or other software to try more, yeah, um, to, to test it on different levels. Um, but yeah, as Alex explained, uh, we're sticking to it for the moment when we need to actually produce the map, we do everything in Google Earth Engine. Um, so, but then this is open to, I'm sure there are so many avenues for improvement and ideas that can come out of it. So, I mean, that's also why we're having this talk. We're super interested, interested in knowing what people could do with it. Like, I'm sure there's um, lots of stuff that can come out of it. So. <laughs> Any thoughts? Um, okay. I see a question. Oh, sorry, Carol. Oh, that's Please. fine. Please go ahead. Uh, this is the question on on uh, biomass. Um, I I think that I, I don't think this product is necessarily the best for detecting biomass, simply because it works really well on showing uh, the difference between cropland and natural vegetation. Um, but I I wouldn't use it for like you know, uh, dry matter, like quantifying dry matter productivity. Um, it's a very visual product. So I, I wouldn't use it. I mean, I think that uh, um, there are other biomass products out there, like, you know, the one, um, the dry matter productivity that's produced by Vito uh, and that's on Sentinel-3, I think is more appropriate. No, I don't know if you... Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, this product, but the methodology that we propose is not for quantitative um, results or anything that's, it's really, um, so you saw the map with the red dots and the yellow dot. This is like what it's used for at the moment. Um, and the product is also, it's very simple. In terms, it's very full visual and, and making um, this very visual product at the end of the day, not to get any quantified um, results. Because uh, we're quite limited in in in, in time, and act, uh, also because what uh, the users that we have, I mean uh, that this methodology was was uh, was uh, developed around operational needs, and uh, the users are yeah not looking for. I mean that would always be great to have um, very specifically quantified products, but in this case, it's uh, it's already a great move from nothing to super precisely quantified products. This is uh, halfway and it's, it comes uh, pretty quickly in a few weeks. So yeah, yeah, this is, uh, for, this product is, is pretty qualitative. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe the last question before we wrap up and move to the next presentation. Um, what other countries have you assessed or are you planning to assess uh, cropland? <laughs> Yeah, so now that's uh, 2020, and it's also it's uh, going to be the, t the case um, this year as well. We've looked at uh, seven countries in West Africa, West and Central Africa. So I can list them by uh, memory. It's Mali and Burkina Faso, uh, Niger, Nigeria, uh, Nigeria, I mean, uh, Cameroon, Central African Republic, and Chad. Yeah. <laughs> But they're all very different, so it's a super it's super interesting because if you look at Central yeah. African Republic, which is very, uh, it's not in the Sahelian band, Cameroon either. So they, you have to adjust the parameters. You can't use the same times, for instance. You can't. You need to really each country has even within a country, you might need to adjust as well as well the parameters of the at the beginning of the script and, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much for your presentation. I think a number Thank of people you. have enjoyed it. Um, we see some really great comments. Um, and I think if anybody else has any more questions, they could definitely find um, Law and Alex maybe in the uh, <laughs> the social um, the social gathering. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Um, just